I wrote at BFTJ's request a little thing about the much loved tower room at Santa Maddalena, which naturally implied writing about one of my favorite boy geniuses, the um, much lamented Bruce Chatwin. Mm -hmm. When I'm in Tuscany, I sleep with Bruce Chatwin. Not, of course, the actual corporeal Bruce Chatwin, who <clears throat> died in 1989 at the age of 45. I sleep in his former bed, in his former room, at the top of the signal tower. His spirit still palpably inhabits the room. He laid, it seems, some profound claim on it when he was still alive, and his presence, though spectral, is the ruling one. I am the ghost there. It was Bruce's room whenever he came to Santa Madalena. The room is gloriously semi-decrepit and rather feminine. Its plaster walls are painted in pink and white stripes. Prints of lightsome East Indian maidens be glittered, play flutes, or smile contemplatively from within gilded frames over the bed. The brick floor is covered with impeccably faded Persian rugs. On the bureau top, a porcelain blue-skinned man embraces a gold and white porcelain woman. It is some mix of an eccentric little girl's room and a seraglio. Bruce's devotion to the room derived in part from the fact that it was a perfect square. He liked squares. He liked perfection. <clears throat> Although there's a second room, a study meant for writing, a floor above the bedroom, Bruce preferred to write in the bedroom because in its precise center there was a square table. He wrote at the square within the square. Many people have slept in the bed in which Bruce once dreamt. It would be silly where Bruce is concerned to imagine that one is singular. And it is, of course, impossible to imagine his dreams, but one suspects that they ran to the vivid, the elemental, and the sexy. Bruce had been a guest at Santa Madalena for many years, since the time when Grisha was still alive, before Beatrice turned it into a sanctuary for writers. Bruce was the first to compose sentences in the tower. He, like many of us who come after, insisted that it was the best place in the world in which to write. Once, when Bruce was writing on the Black Hill in the tower room, <clears throat> the maid, as Grisha writes in anecdotage, went to the tower to straighten up and return to the straw. How many people are staying in the tower? Just Senor Chatwin, why? She'd overheard an entire assortment of voices, men, women, children. It was Bruce writing, reading aloud the many-voiced chaos at a country fair in Wales. <clears throat> the room inspires that kind of dramatic vitality. It is quiet, but not in any way inert. Like most significant rooms, it is inhabited not only by Bruce's essence, but by something benign and encouraging that must have been there the day Bruce arrived. The animus of certain rooms is a mystery for us to appreciate, and not one to try and solve. Although I never met Bruce, I not only admire his work, but feel a certain kinship with him. He was a gay man who wrote books and loved beautiful things. I am a gay man who writes books and loves beautiful things. I'm aware of his presence as I sleep in the bed in which he slept, as I bathe in the tub in which he bathed. Beatrice, in order to help returning writers feel at home, insists that no objects be removed or changed. I am in precisely the room occupied by Bruce. His own apartment in London was rigorously minimal. An ancient feathered Inca cloak hung on one wall. Otherwise, it was all white and gray and low to the floor. If the tower room at Santa Maddalena resembles a seraglio, Bruce's own rooms were more like those of a Shinto shrine. Now, I suspect he appreciated, or was at least bemused, by the eclectic clutter of Santa Maddalena, where a calder painting hangs near a ceramic bust picked up at, a, at the flea market in Arezzo where a chest of drawers exquisitely inlaid with mother of pearl sports a lamp bought at a rummage sale. Bruce came here to write when he was healthy, 
and he came here to write as he began slowly to die. He was a great beauty. Grisha writes of him as the golden boy, in his eyes the Aegean. He arrived once at Santa Maddalena, fresh from a surfing trip to Greece and Grisha again. His shorts, which came to just below the crotch, revealed his hiker's legs in all their splendor. No one would have thought this belated youth capable of writing anything more than his own name. And yet he was virtually glowing with promise. <clears throat> he was also, by all accounts, charming, magnetic, and narcissistic. But he was one of those rare narcissists whose self-regard creates a nimbus that envelops the people in its immediate proximity, that elevates you simply because you are the object of the narcissist's attention. He was enormously curious. He was in love with the world. And it was possible, it seems, in Bruce's company to feel more interesting than you actually were. He was a connoisseur of objects and of people. As to the latter, one needed to be interesting. And being interesting helped if one was a famous writer or a contessa. As to the former, it helped if the object <clears throat> was a treasure beyond, beyond reckoning. When he was cogent, he paid far more than he could afford for rugs, art, and antiquities, each of them something with which one could plausibly appease an angry sultan. When his mind began to fade, he bought a collection of dresses that had been worn by the Duchess of Windsor. When he was cogent and in situ in Santa Maddalena, he was particularly fixated on a triangular shard of glazed terracotta Beatrice smuggled out of Pompeii. Smuggled out of Pompeii, yes. By now the truth can be told. <laughs> <clears throat> he offered to trade her for it, some object of commensurate worth, but she refused. The shard still stands on a shelf in the topmost room. I'm looking at it now, the thing Bruce so coveted. It outlasted him, as most of our possessions outlast us. Maybe that's part of why we who love objects love them as we do. They will continue to exist when we no longer do. Bruce, Bruce had promised Candest and began to fade in this room. Witnessed by the Indian girls and the bookshelves crammed with books and the tile-framed mirror for which the porcelain couple embrace. <coughs> yeah, keep smoking. Um, <coughs> thank you. Good idea. In order to picture the tower, you should know where it stands. One walks to it from the main house through a grove of olive trees intertwined with roses. The house and tower overlook the Arno Valley, and after you've climbed the two staircases to the upstairs bedroom, if you look out the window, you see, among other wonders, the ruins of a Moorish palace, a folly, built by a long-dead nobleman, abandoned, crumbling, but still cutting its crenellated, turreted shape out of the sky on the opposite ridge. More immediately, you see that the garden below is alive with at least six different kinds of bees. My own favorite is a languid monster, just smaller than my thumb, with purple dragonflies and a species of white butterfly that hover ecstatically by the dozens around the lavender bushes. Occasionally, a hare bounds by. A hare resembles a rabbit in very much the way an Olympic athlete resembles an accountant. <laughs> If you wake at dawn and go to the window, you understand that a great green smell wafts up from the valley at sunup. It's not different, not exactly different, from the smell that pervades Santa Maddalena always, but it is, for reasons I don't understand, deeper and more intense when the sun rises. I can identify honeysuckle and linden, but it's much more complex than that. It's the smell of the green, wakening world. It is the ripest, most maternal, imaginable landscape. It may strike you as edible, not just in its particulars of fruit and game, but in its entirety. You may find yourself wondering why, millennia ago, anyone would have chosen to migrate to the snows of the north or the aridity of the south. I've never seen a landscape so crazy with life. Bruce, the golden boy, the lover of beauty, was crazy with life here in this room. 
and here in this room, his lights began to fade. Bruce told almost no one except Grisha that he had AIDS, and even with Grisha, he couldn't call the disease by its name. He died in a hospital in London. As Grisha writes, oh, did I, did I, did I, I got, I, I haven't corrected it. Correction. He, he died being a guest of some friends in the uh, South of France. Thank you. He wanted to go to the guest, to be honest. Yes, yeah, okay, he, yeah, well. <laughs> Noted. Um, <clears throat> as Kalisha writes, I saw an impatience in Bruce's eyes just a few weeks before his death. Sapphire blue visionary's eyes glittering frantically in a boyish Anglo-Saxon head that had already become a skull. We all know very well whether we are golden or composed of a somewhat less precious material. What waits for us after we've had our chance to see the white butterflies browsing the lavender and the hairs leaping past on legs the size of a child's forearm? After we've hurried through the gate at Santa Maddalena with our surfboard still tied to the top of our car in shorts that show our well-muscled legs to their best advantage. Bruce's ashes are buried at the base of an olive tree on a mountaintop in Greece. Did I get that right? <laughs> Grisha's ashes are, are beside a small stone pyramid in a little grove visible from the tower window. In time, in a very long time, we assume, Beatrice's ashes will be interred beside Grisha's, and a rose bush will be planted on top of them. Screens have been installed in the windows of the tower room since I was, <clears throat> since the first time I was there. But the first time, <clears throat> the first time I was there, most nights when I lay in bed reading, an elegant little pitch black bat would flutter in through the bedroom window, fly in modest circles around the room, and then perform the act most desired of bats that fly into rooms. Go back out again. <laughs> I don't actually believe in ghosts, only in presences, but it was impossible not to imagine that it was an embodiment of Bruce's spirit, come back to make sure that the walls still bore pink and white stripes, that the square table remained in the exact center of the room and the Indian couple still embraced on the bureau top. They do. Thank you.